part of the third annual tradition, the Festival of Freedom, an international movement, a universal movement to bring people of all faiths, ethnic, religious backgrounds together to celebrate what we all hold dear, and that is freedom. What we have discovered is that through the universal values of Passover, the Festival of Freedom, that we can indeed come together equally and celebrate the values of freedom together. That's why we're here today, and that's why there are people of many different faiths sitting with us today. Dolores. I just got a scripture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. This is a gift from the Lubavitch for us, for our Seder, and we graciously appreciate it. Those of us who live in foreign countries, how do we take part of Yerushalayim and part of Eretz Yisrael, this land, back with us? So I said that when um, I went to the wall the other day and I looked at the wall, it reminded me of a piece of matzah. And I invite all of you from here on, every time you look at a piece of matzah, to remember the wall. And also that the wall can also be barriers. And as we break the matzah, perhaps part of what it represents is the breaking of our heart, for a stranger, for a hungry person, for someone other than we, breaking down every kind of barrier that separates people. As our tradition teaches, it's the barriers, it's the walls between hearts and hearts that prevent the Mashiach, the Messiah, from each of us, in each of us, from manifesting. So we pick up our matzah, we break it, and we say, may there be a new opening, and may we share our bread together. Baruch Asa Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMosi Lechem Min HaRetz, Amen. And let me invite you to feed someone else. Mm -hmm. I'm David Zeller, um, originally from Los Angeles, now living just outside Jerusalem in Efrat. Uh, it's a very, very great pleasure to be with you in what has been a continuing dialogue between Jews and Christians and Muslims, as well as people of other religions as well, Hindus and Buddhists. I don't know if I start the list, I'll be up here all night. Uh, I think that dialogue between people is absolutely essential for the survival of our planet, for the life of all humanity on it. Uh, I honor the dialogue. I honor all traditions. I welcome all of you here. It's a great blessing to be able to join you uh, tonight. It's a chance to really have a real revelation to really know there's a purpose for life on this planet, a purpose for every single person on this planet, every people on this planet, every nation on this planet. And if we could only get a taste of that purpose and take that with us and carry that back out into the world, we will be more free. We will help make the world more free and we will be more one. Thank you. Amen. this ritual all about? It's a very, very deep question because I think it asks us every day, what are we doing with our lives? Like God asked Adam and Eve in the garden, where are we? 
Where are we? What are we doing with our lives, with our rituals? Are we really creating the kinds of worlds that we want to create? And the tradition says that the child has many potential ways of asking the question. And perhaps the, the passages in the Haggadah in the traditional book which describe these ways are ways of asking us to look anew at questions. And as we know from many traditions, Hasidic traditions, Zen traditions, our own traditions, our own experience just the other night, that sometimes there are questions that are so deep and so profound that the only answer cannot even be words, it can only be silence, a response of silence, and then a genuine reaching out to one another. And all we can do is share questions and recognize that we are all struggling, we are all lost, we are all yearning to be free, yearning to find ways, paths. We would not be here in the Seder some 3,500 years later if the path to peace were easy, if the path to justice were easy, if the path to see that all people have matzah bread on their table were easy. But it isn't, and Moshe Rabbeinu knew that 3,500 years ago. God knew how difficult it would be that we need to renew our commitment and our goals each evening. So let me call upon Rep. David Zeller to do a teaching on the questions. In our tradition, we learn that the Haggadah was originally put together by Elijah the prophet. And we call him a prophet because we call anyone a prophet because they have the ability to reach beyond time and space, to see through these 3,500 years. To know what the whole world goes through, what individual people go through, what different nations go through, what the Jewish people would go through, what other people would go through, for how many people maybe the Jewish history would be a metaphor for their own personal history. I guess the commercial is you don't have to be Jewish to like rye bread or whatever it is. Yeah, I, you know, but uh, you don't have to be Jewish to have come through in Egypt. You don't have to be Jewish to go through a, a dark, constricted, confining experience in your life. But our tradition is a tradition of asking questions. And perhaps one of the signs of freedom at a festival of freedom, at a Seder celebrating freedom, is we were free to ask questions. And this is a tradition, no matter how written down it all seems to be, or how controlled it seems to be from some perspective or other, written into the tradition is you've got to ask questions. Not just you can if you want. You have to ask questions. And you have to ask the deepest, deepest questions. Because if you aren't questioning yourself and the world around you, you're still a slave. A slave can't ask a question, why should I? Why do I have to? I mean, as much as we don't like it when our kids ask us those questions, thank God they're free to ask. I mean, when we think about it, what greater sign of freedom than to be able to ask questions? The whole Seder is filled with four, four cups of wine, four questions, the four sons, the four children, and on and on. I want to just take a couple of things on the four questions and the four children. These are a weaving together of teachings that I learned from Reb Shlomo Karlbach Zal, my teacher, and I know someone who was a Rebbe for, for many of you, many of us, and uh, teachings of my own that I've, I've added to this. There's a lot of questions we ask. The truth is I know the answer. I'm only asking it because I want to let you know that I know the answer. There's questions that you can ask, and, you know, I honestly... I can ask a question, I don't know the answer. But the answer does exist. 
And perhaps in asking it, someone may know the answer. Then there are questions you can ask, and there really is no answer. But still, it has to be asked. Our problem today is too many people are trying to answer those questions that can't be answered. That, that's another night's discussion, perhaps. And then there are questions that are so deep. It's not just that they don't have answers. The truth is, we can't even ask the question. Doesn't mean the question isn't there. But it comes from so, so deep down. The question just is. And in many ways, we parallel the depth of these questions with the four children, who in, the, in many of the Haggadahs, they show pictures. And the wise child is this very wise, you know, kid you can see is getting straight A's, and he asks this intelligent question, oh, I'm so proud of my son, my daughter, who asked this. But the point is they're asking what they already know the answer to. And by many of the more mystical texts, we don't think the wise son is so wise. The, quote, wicked one who's pictured as a gangster, a thug, uh, I don't know what, you know. He's asking questions, and he doesn't have the answers. He might be mad about the fact that he doesn't. He might be mad about the fact that he doesn't think you've got the answers. And we usually call him wicked because we're embarrassed that we don't know the answers. How often somebody asks a question, I say, you didn't raise your hand. I mean, the point is, I don't know the answer. But I can't tell you I don't know. I'll tell you, you didn't raise your hand. And then we come to the, the one who was told who was, doesn't even know how to ask and is usually pictured as a, as a baby, pre-verbal. And according again to mystical interpretation, this is the child who's connected to that deepest, deepest level where you can't even ask. This is the highest one, not the lowest one. It doesn't go from the wise down to the one who can't speak. It's the other way around. So we need a child to remind us what it means to believe there are answers. And it takes a child to teach us that you can even ask questions. You don't care if there's an answer. You just want to ask. You just need to ask. But in many satyrs of some of the big, big rebbies, as though they would have the young child ask first, some of them, as we went around to say, my name is and I'm from, and they would have every single person at the table ask the questions. But those were just the outer words, the outer opportunity for the deepest, deepest questions that everybody could ask. Who am I? Why am I here? What are we supposed to do? What's the purpose of life? What can I do to make the world a better place? How can I fix my broken heart? How can I fix the broken heart of people around me? Go to the deepest, deepest, deepest place. Most people think that the four questions is foolishness to keep children's attention through the Seder and nothing more. And they think that opening the door for Elijah is just to keep children awake. So they say, oh, wait, we have to wait till we open the door. It's the saddest thing to hear this low level interpretation of these deepest, deepest practices. If you can ask that question from the <laughs> deepest place within you, and only if you've asked that question from that deepest place within you, to reach the innocence within you, to reach the one that still believes the world can be a good place. If you can ask it from that deepest, deepest place, when it comes time to open the door, you really are opening 
new doors, new passageways. You really are bringing Elijah the prophet, the one who brings opposites together, the one who answers all the questions, the one who lives beyond the limitations of time and space. But if the questions are empty, so is the opening the door. If the questions come from the deepest depths, the opening the door may open doorways into areas and aspects of our lives and healing in the world that we can't even begin to dream of. But it's real, and it certainly is something we cannot question the truth in it. Yes, Because of my brothers and friends, because of my sisters and friends, please let me ask, please let me say, peace to you. you know. And our word peace in Hebrew, shalom, and Jerusalem, the city of peace, shalom comes from the word shalem, and it means to be whole, to be complete. When we say to somebody, I wish you peace, we're wishing wholeness. We're wishing completeness. When we're trying to establish peace between people, we mean to feel whole and complete. Sadly enough, too much of what we call peace in this world is just a ceasefire. And what we call peace of mind, it's just a ceasefire. I get my thoughts to stop for a little bit, and I have the chutzpah to call it peace of mind. It sees fire of mind. Okay. But to really understand peace between people doesn't just mean, okay, let's stop shooting at each other. It means why are we fighting? Why are we fighting? Let's get together. I had the privilege of being at, a, at an Arab-Israeli dialogue recently, and I was... I was saddened by how many of the Arabs and the Israelis were talking about, well, if we're doomed to live together, you know, how do we work it out? And I said, maybe we're destined to live together. Maybe we're destined to live together. Do we have to only see it as, as being doomed? Can we learn to live together, to coexist? What did they say? Most of them changed their language and began to say, well, if we're, and then they'd look at me and say, destined to live together. And if they really wanted to make a very strong point, they'd say, doomed, and look at me. But, but I had introduced, and I think they took it. I think they took it. So this song is because of my brothers and friends, because of my sisters and friends. You know, let me, please let me ask, please let me say, peace to you. And we say, this is the house, the house of the Lord. I wish the best for you. And here too, we're not talking about a particular synagogue, a particular church, a particular mosque. We're talking about the world. There's a very beautiful teaching from our tradition that says, the world is a home for those who know who built it. The world is a home for those who know who built it. You know, and those, we can only be at home in the world if we know who built it. This is also a melody, the last one was this one too of Rabbi Shlomo Karl Bachzal. Because of my brothers and friends of my sisters and friends, please let me ask, please let me say, peace to you, because of my brothers and friends, because of my sisters and friends, please let me ask. 
Please let me 